Well, good morning, and thank you all for being here. This is a nice uh, turnout of folks as we're getting back a little bit to normal, right? As normal as things are. Uh, so it's nice to see people. And uh, a couple of announcements. First of all, uh, the insert is, is kind of unusual. Um, uh, <laughs> we were hoping the Red Sox could sign him as a free agent. Unfortunately, he died in 2013. But uh, Stan Musial uh, is there, and he, he will join us later in the service. Uh, we're not having a seance or anything, but a story about him, uh, one which is personal and uh, one which will have a very distinguished American broadcaster help us with. But, um, so that'll be coming up. But that's, uh, I thought I should put those in there in case people didn't know who he was. I found a one-page description uh, in one of the baseball books I had, and I was excited because baseball is back so, too, so uh, that's where that comes from. Um, on Palm Sunday, uh, which will be April the 10th, we'll be having our um, One Great Hour of Sharing offering. So not only do we have special offerings, and, and we put the information on the bulletin again this week uh, for the Ukraine, uh, but we also um, do this one offering a year, which is a, in several Protestant denominations, and it's a, for a great cause. It's, it's for, there's a hunger fund uh, that gets some of that money, some of the money goes into having available when there are disasters in the world, and others, um, other funds are used to support uh, poor and oppressed peoples, and that includes um, uh, folks in the field all over the world. So it's a, it's a wonderful cause, and um, we'll be talking more about it in the next couple of weeks. Uh, let's see, are there other announcements we should be making? Yes, is that Ellen? And then Lynn, go ahead. Come right up, we have a stand on everything now. Um, first, I'd want to say thank you again. First, I want to say thank you again to uh, Barbara and Lynn for these wonderful flowers that are gracing the sanctuary over Lent. And I understand from Lynn that this plant here is called a prayer plant. Very appropriate. <laughs> Second thing is, very happily, we're having Easter in the sanctuary this year. I'm so happy. And as per tradition and by request, we are going to be accepting donations of Easter plants. I have a sign-up <coughs> sheet. Uh, it will be under Jesus' portrait over there. Uh, and the cost is $10 a plant. And after Easter service, you can take the plant home to enjoy. So sign up over the next few weeks. The week before Easter, I'll go buy the plants and bring them into the sanctuary. Are they lilies and tulips or just lilies? Wow, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> <laughs> they might even be tulips, daffodils, and lilies. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. So, oh. Any other questions, feel free to see me after church or Barbara. And speaking of after church, we haven't made it yet into the parlor, but we do have coffee and cookies in the hallway. In the Dignard room. Oh, you moved it? Yeah. Wonderful job. <laughs> so the coffee's no better than usual because I made it, but it got moved, so it probably improved in there. So we'd like to welcome all of you to uh, have some after service fellowship. It's in the Dignard room. There's coffee and sweets, and um, if you're looking for information about the great hour of sharing, there's a table there as well that has information, and it has Lenten fish for collecting coins, um, and all of that kind of literature is also in there as well, and we hope that you're able to join us and just say hello. Okay, the Dignard Room. Well, we're making progress. That's the opposite direction from the parlor, but it's, the, it's a little better place. Yes, I think that's right. Yes, Laura. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, so I'm watching the, uh, the evening news. As you all know, it's uh, pretty depressing to watch and really scary. So as you know, I, I like to uh, sew. I'm a quilter and a sewer. And so I had this bag of things in front of me. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to start making these um, little commemorative things for the Ukraine. And I'm not sure, Woody, how that may tie into the... Um, 
your mention of uh, donations or whatever the offerings for um, war-torn countries and poverty-stricken places. And I'd like to just hand these out today to anybody who would like them and to remind you to um, contribute to any of your charities for the Ukraine. That's a great idea. Great idea. So can people see you afterward and get? You can hand them out now if you want. Nothing important, I'm just talking. No, no, please. I meant that seriously. I'm going to explain where Stan Musial got the name The Man. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, please, pass those around. I think that's a great, and Carolyn, uh, uh, where's Carolyn, up here, she had a great idea, and uh, next week hopefully we'll have a letter uh, that she will compose, and if you like it, you can sign it, or make, take it home and sign it. Um, or make your own uh, a letter. We're going to send a, start a letter writing campaign. We have a new uh, what do you call that? A, when you have a buddy, you write back and forth with a what? A pen pal. A pen pal, and his name is Boris Putin, or not Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Don't put Boris; he'll get mad. But we'll have that next week. Okay. While she's passing those out, I want to tell you where Stan Musial became the man. Um, that nickname. Uh, it was from people in Brooklyn. Uh, when the Brooklyn Dodgers played uh, in Brooklyn, and he would come in there with the Cardinals, and they had a big scoreboard in right field that wasn't too far away. Duke Snyder could hit the ball over that pretty frequently into Bedford Avenue. Ebbets Field was a magical place. But, um, but Stan the Man just tattooed the ball off the wall all the time, and it was Brooklyn fans that not very fondly named him the man because he was the man on the St. Louis Cardinals that... Uh, I sent them home unhappy many times when they played the Dodgers. So, okay, are there other announcements or birthdays or anniversaries? Bar mitzvahs? What, somebody's waving over here? It's me. Well, Dick, <laughs> Dick's pointing to you and you're pointing to him. I don't know. Is somebody up there need to say something or no? Okay. Um, I just wanted to um, remind people that last week I had announced that I'm accepting Ukrainian uh, donations to be sent to Ukraine and we are packing those boxes on Tuesday so you still have two more days to uh, drop them off at our farm. Thank you. Okay, thank you Karina. Anyone else? Yes, Don. what happens in a disaster. And we had one in Florida many years ago, which devastated a whole section of the uh, lower part of Florida. And people donated all kinds of things, but they didn't donate money. They would send boxes, they would send cards, they would send all kinds of things which nobody had the time to sort. So it all went into a ball field, and when the disaster slowed down, they were able to take it to the dump. Oh, my. All of it. So if you are going to donate something, make sure you're involved with an organization that has the ability to hire a ship or a plane to get it there. Don't just be good with your neighbors. Make sure you're connected to somebody who can make your donation worthwhile. That's all I want to say. That's a very important announcement. Thank you, Don. That was great. Okay, anyone else here? If not, we begin the service with our morning prelude.
we gathered to worship the God who sent a man named Jesus, who calmed the waters whirling around he and his disciples' boat, and who promised that whenever the waters roll around uh, our lives, his spirit is with us, a spirit of love. So let us begin to worship as we sing our opening hymn, number 375. From Psalm 150, and we find it on the announcement side of our bulletins. Let us read together. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. share together in our affirmation of faith. It is from the Confession of 1967 of the Presbyterian Church nationally, and I especially like the second and third sentences here. They're very, very thoughtful. Let us read together. We acknowledge that God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of human minds. We ascribe to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness. But in Jesus Christ, God reveals love by showing power in the form of a servant, wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinful people. The power of God's love in Christ transforms the world and discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and Creator who made all things to serve the purpose of his love. Thank you. 
everything here is tightly scripted. I want everyone to know that. So, uh, but <laughs> that was wonderful. That was wonderful. Well, uh, our scripture reading is a very familiar one. Uh, I'm preaching a, the several weeks before we got to Palm Sunday on on some of the uh, Psalms, and this is or not the Psalms, but the uh, the parables of Jesus, and this is probably the best known one. It's the Good Samaritan story, as we find it in the 10th chapter of Luke, beginning with the 25th verse. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road. Probably to be fair, we should also add a minister was with him. Um, and uh, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, man of the law, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So, which of these three do you think proved neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer answered, the one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. And here ends our reading. Now, before the children's sermon, take a moment to wave, fist bump, uh, whatever, to people around you, and there are more people uh, than we've had for weeks. This is wonderful. <laughs> now, for the children's sermon, I, um, I'm making a special concession. I was going to sing, uh, but... I'm not going to do that. We have so many people here. I don't want anyone to leave. It's just that nice to see someone. So, but I'm going to read you some words, kids. Uh, they used to begin a children's television show because uh, the Good Samaritan story is about being a good neighbor. Neighbor was in there. And uh, there used to be a man that would come out at the beginning of the television show on uh, Channel 11 here in New, in, um, New Hampshire, Channel 2 uh, in Boston. I don't even know if they have channel numbers anymore, do they? I can't even figure out. Thank goodness my wife works at TV. I can't figure out how to get it down. But anyway, this man would come out. He always had his sweater on. And he would sing this song, which I'll read you the words of. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in the beauty wood, a neighboring day... Uh, uh, for a beauty, would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of a beautiful day. Uh, since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please, won't you please be, please won't you be my neighbor? Now, this man, I'm always proud to say, was a Presbyterian minister, but he never pastored a church, but he pastored a much bigger church than any church he could have pastored because he had children all over the country 
that watch the show. Mr. Rogers was his name, Fred Rogers, graduate of Pittsburgh Theological School, and a wonderful man, and he taught us that we are all neighbors. He used to frequently say on the air to all the kids, he had kids in the studio, but he, and he had puppets, and it was a wonderful show, and he would say to the kids, I like you just the way you are. And um, they made some movies about Mr. Rogers uh, when he was no longer on the air, and then after he died, one of them with, had Tom Hanks uh, as Mr. Rogers, and if you're played by Tom Hanks, you have to be a good guy. I mean, you know, let's be honest here. Except maybe when he was that uh, drunken manager in the League of Their Own, but that was a great role, anyway. But um, uh, Tom Hanks played him, and then they made a documentary about Mr. Rogers, and the man who was the director of that's name was Morgan Neville, and I came across uh, what he said about Mr. Rogers uh, directing uh, this documentary, and he looked at just about all Mr. Rogers' TV shows over many, many years, and he said... To paraphrase Mr. Neville, this is how we should treat each other. And this is how we should treat ourselves. The idea of a neighborhood is kind of our society. How are we going to live together? Um, and Mr. Neville used the term uh, that I think fits the teachings of Jesus of uh, and, and the teachings of Mr. Rogers, which were basic. He never used the word God on his TV show, by the way. But he taught the teachings of God. And uh, uh, Morgan Neville used the term radical kindness. Radical kindness. So kids, try to practice radical kindness with everybody. Uh, even if you disagree with them about something, or you don't get along with them necessarily, be kind. That's practicing radical kindness. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, when we get to the sermon, which is uh, coming up here uh, right after our next hymn, uh, which is number 392. <laughs> Well, there's a rumor going around. Um, have you heard the rumor about butter? Well, I'm not going to spread it. So we're going to... <laughs> that was on the margarine of jokes. Um, that's a joke without the fat, I guess. I don't know. Well, this morning we had one of Jesus' best-known parables, and I think it's a remarkable story 
with many applications. Now, let me share with you one application. We always think of a neighbor as the person that lives next door, right? I mean, that's just the genuine, the, the, uh, the uh, frequent way we think of neighbors. And uh, Frederick Buechner has a wonderful uh, definition uh, or a little statement here about neighbors. He says, when Jesus said to love your neighbor, a lawyer who was present asked him to clarify what he meant by neighbor. He wanted a legal definition he could refer to in case the question of loving one ever happened to come up. He presumably wanted something on the order of, a neighbor there and after referred to as the party of the first part is to be construed as meaning a person of Jewish descent whose legal residence is within a radius of no more than three statute miles from one's own legal residence unless there is another person of Jewish descent here and after referred to as the party of the second part living close to the party of the first part than one is oneself, in which case the party of the second part is to be construed as neighbor to the party of the first part, and one is oneself relieved of all responsibility of any sort or kind whatsoever. Instead, Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, the point of which seems to be that your neighbor is to be construed as meaning anyone who needs you. The lawyer's response is left unrecorded. Mr. Rogers, uh, this, there are many applications to this story. Uh, Mr. Rogers made it the theme of his TV show to teach children that we're all neighbors. And as I said, he never used the word God or, or said that Jesus taught us that he just, he just treated all the kids, not only the ones that were on the show, but the ones that were watching the show, as neighbors or friends. And I think the, uh, the documentarian who made that uh, movie that I, I kind of paraphrased his quote, uh, had it right, you know. Uh, uh, neighbors are people we know and people we don't know, but uh, uh, we're to be neighbors to all kinds of people uh, in many ways. Um, there was a version of the Gospels that was popular in the 1950s and 60s um, called the Cotton Patch Gospels. I see Craig nodding his head, yes. And that, in that, this story and those Gospels, uh, this was kind of paraphrased. It wasn't, an interpret, it wasn't a uh, translation from the Greek of the New Testament. It was a paraphrase. Uh, in an attempt to uh, point out the truth in the statements without translating from the Greek. And, and that, this story in the Gospel Patch version of the Gospels, uh, you have a Jewish man attacked by robbers, you know, beaten on the head, robbed, left uh, bleeding on the side of the road, and the same people pass on by. You know, you have a, you have a, you have a priest or a minister pass by, and you have a uh, you know, a lawyer passed by, and then who stops to help the white man along the side of the road who was beaten up? It's a black man. Now, in the 1950s and 60s, um, in the South, well, in many places, and sadly, still, you can find some places where this is true, whites hated blacks, but the black man stops to help. That's what the Samaritan was. I mean, in Jesus' time, the Jews and the Samaritans uh, did not get along well. But the man stops, and he is the neighbor. Not the fellow Jew uh, in uh, Jesus' story, uh, not the religious leader, not the, uh, uh, the man who knows the law, and the law would tell him to, to help his fellow Jew. They were all scared. I don't blame them. I'm not you know, saying I would have stopped that, you know. I might have driven on by, I don't know. But we're called to help each other. Jesus wants people to be neighbors. I think that's uh, pretty clear. Now in today's world, um, uh, I think it's appropriate to say that Mr. Rogers' vision, and I think Jesus' vision 2,000 years before Mr. Rogers, was that we live in a global village, that we are all to be neighbors 
uh, to one another. Now, how do you be a neighbor to somebody that you, you don't know? Well, and then it's far away in this case, like the Ukraine. Well, I think uh, contributing, uh, as Don helped us understand what it's like to be on the other end, the agency that's trying to deliver the help, uh, we can give money. Um, and certainly uh, we have in the bulletin a place you can send contributions to help the folks in the midst of this horror of the Ukraine. Uh, one great hour sharing is coming up. That's a wonderful offering which helps people all over the world. You can do that. But then I got thinking about this, and you know, there are some simple but also very profound ways that you can be in, we can be neighbors to each other uh, all over the world. Uh, the first thing I thought of was civility. Civility. I think we're losing some sense of being civil to each other. I think we're losing it in this town. Um, to some degree, if you attend a school board meeting, it's, it, I, the one I went to about a year ago was pretty nasty. People are screaming and hollering at each other for no apparent reason. Um, civility. I mean, it used to be, I, this was kind of comical. I don't know if this takes place anymore. In the United States House of Representatives, or the United States Senate, um, uh, even if uh, a representative in the House or a senator stood up to argue against somebody else, he would, he or she, mostly he back in the 50s and 60s, I guess, he or she would say, my esteemed colleague, and then tell you why my esteemed colleague is wrong, but they would say, my esteemed colleagues. There was a sense of respect and stability, um, civility, and I think that's not around too much. Even simpler than civility, which is not always easy to maintain if you disagree with somebody in a heated way, but I think we need to try that, is a wave, a hello, a kind word. So now let's bring in um, one man, Stan the Man. Stan the Man Musial. I happened to think of that this, this week, I guess because baseball was back. And, um, and I thought of um, an experience I had. Uh, I was about, I think, 13 or 14, uh, growing up, Garden City, New York. I had had a friend who used to beat me up all the time in first grade, and then uh, at the urging of my parents and grandmother, who was a very peaceful lady, I beat him up once, uh, and then we became friends. I shouldn't have beaten him up. I apologize for that. But we did become friends. His name was Keith Armstrong. And uh, he and I both loved baseball, as most kids did uh, back in the 1950s. And uh, we played on the same Little League team when I was 12, and his, his dad was the coach, Mr. Armstrong. Great, great gentleman. A great gentleman. Well, he uh, then moved to New Jersey, and he uh, either sent a note or called me, I don't know which, uh, and, and um, I think I was at the time probably 13 or 14, um, so I'd have been in what was in those days junior high, now I guess I'd be middle school, and um, wanted to know if I could come spend a week with him in New Jersey, because he hadn't seen me and we hadn't seen each other, and so I think my parents... Uh, they always seemed to, when I was 13 or 14, to like to get me out of the house. I don't know what the reason for that was. But anyway, they thought this was a good idea. So I went. Um, and I don't remember what town he was in, but it was the part of New Jersey that's pretty close to Philadelphia, you know, down around Trenton. And we went swimming, and, uh, but we also went to a ball game in Philadelphia, just he and I. So I must have been at least 14, I would think. Took the bus into the city. Now, he and I had shared something in common uh, in Garden City on Long Island where everybody was either a Dodger fan, a Yankee fan, or a Giant fan. There were three baseball teams in New York at the time. And um, we rooted for other teams. He rooted for the St. Louis Cardinals, and I rooted for the Philadelphia Phillies because my parents were from Philadelphia as well. I should have been a Dodger fan. I, I have a Dodger hat I wear now. But anyway, um, so we went to what was called a twinite doubleheader. Um, and that was a game that they started the first game at 5 o'clock, and they were actually through both games by 9 o'clock, which would be about the average length of a game today, uh, uh, one game. Uh, they got to do something about that. But anyway, um, 
So we went to Connie Mack Stadium in Philadelphia, which looked a lot like Ebbets Field. And um, before the game, you could get in early and watch batting practice. They don't let you do that anymore to, uh, either. I don't know why. It's really fun to watch these guys hit. But So we went. We were there. And you could go down in the box seats. We were sitting in the cheap seats, of course. But you could go down in the box seats and stand along the railing that separated the ballpark from the field to get autographs before the game. And so kids would routinely be down there getting autographs. So we went down there, Keith and I, and uh, there was Stan Musial uh, signing autographs. It was a line of kids. So just when we became the next kids that were going to get an autograph, after standing in line, probably 20 minutes, a horn sounded in the dugout, which meant the players had to get off the field because they're going to start the game. Stan Musial looked at us and said, fellas, I'm awfully sorry. I have to go into the dugout now. I hope you'll try to get my autograph again. I'm sorry. Well, that meant more to me than an autograph. I remember now over 50 years later that Stan Musial told me he was sorry. Um, you got to understand, when I was a kid, boy, these ball players were like gods, small g, but uh, they really were, and that was... That was pretty special. I thought that was pretty nice of him uh, in thinking back on it 50 years ago. So I did a little searching on the um, proverbial YouTube. It's incredible what you can find on there. And one of our new friends here at the church, uh, because he permitted me to, to uh, put on when we were just doing virtual services, a eulogy he did for Hank Aaron. This man's name is Bob Costas. And boy, he's a great sportscaster. NBC and the Major League Baseball Network. He's the best, and, and what a fan of baseball. He grew up in Queens, uh, outside of, uh, just outside, well, it's part of New York City, technically. And then when he was a kid, uh, when he was about 12, I guess they moved to California. But anyway, I watched his uh, eulogy for Stan Musial, which he gave in 2013. He's great at doing eulogies. When I die, would somebody call him, see if he'd come? I, <laughs> You know, do a eulogy. I, that would be uh, great. But anyway, uh, he, um, so in his eulogy, um, he talks, he tells a story about Stan Musial, in fact, two stories, about the 1950s. Now, let me just set this up by saying this is a time after Jackie Robinson had become the first black to play in the major leagues, and there were more, but there still were not a lot. And apparently the uh, situation in Baseball clubhouses was not necessarily friendly and integrated. And so with uh, Paul's help here, we're going to hear now a much more intelligent guy than me uh, over the PA system, and you'll hear it at home as well. We were going to show this, but then we were afraid, but Bob Constance said it was okay. I was going to show Mr. Rogers, but we thought Facebook would bump us off for sure with that. So, but here are the, here's Bob. Bob, you ready? Okay. More of the significant black and Hispanic players came to the National League than to the American League. Some were met with open hostility. In fact, they all were by some ball players. Some players were openly hostile. Others kept a wary distance. Stan was not an activist by nature. He was just a thoroughly decent human being. Willie Mays and Hank Aaron have each many times in the past and again this week, told the story of how at an All-Star game in the 1950s, all the great black players, Frank Robinson, Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, Ernie Banks, were kind of gathered in a corner of the National League clubhouse playing cards. No white players anywhere near them. When Stan just walked up and casually said, deal me in, that was his way of letting those players know that they were welcome. When the right-handed pitcher, Joe Black, who was one of the first to follow Jackie Robinson to the Brooklyn Dodgers, was heckled from the Cardinal bench, it's not an episode we're proud of. There were some things said that we wish we could erase. Some were said while Stan was in the batter's box, not by him, but from the dugout. He stepped out of the box and he kicked at the dirt. 
And when the game was over, he sought Joe Black out in the tunnel. And he said, I'm sorry you had to hear those things, but you're going to have a great career. And I just wanted you to know that. This week, I spoke with Hank Aaron. He said, I didn't just like Stan Musial. I wanted to be like him. And then you heard that pause in there? Um, I saw an interview with Bob Costas in which he was asked about that pause, and he said, well, I was overcome with emotion. He said, I, he said it's interesting. I try to analyze when I speak why I um, react certain ways. He said, I can tell a very sad and tragic story without being overcome with emotion. It's when I tell a story that reveals human decency that it gets to me, and that's why he paused in the middle of that eulogy for Stan Musial uh, and regrouped, so to speak, uh, to finish his eulogy. I thank uh, Mr. Costas for allowing us to use that. And as followers of Jesus of Nazareth, who in his life was a great neighbor to all kinds of people, may we, with God's help, try to be good neighbors to our fellow human beings, those we know and those we don't know. And in trying to be good neighbors, uh, let us do what we can to practice in our own way radical kindness. And let us bow together in prayer. <laughs> Gracious God, we, we thank you for those who have taught us how to be kind, those who have been examples of Jesus' teachings. We especially thank you for Jesus who came to help us understand that there are better ways to live, to live in peace, with compassion and kindness for one another. Help us to practice that in a world that often seems harsh and unkind and unloving. We thank you for all those in our lives who have taught us to love and to share and to be kind to one another. Those who have been in our lives as family members and friends and those who have touched us who are better known as I still am grateful for words of apologies from Stan, the man Musial. Thank you for those who in a quiet way, as he did, bring about social change by helping others feel welcome instead of unwelcome, by milk making others not other, but part of us. Help us to learn from that, to do that, as your people, let us help to make those who are not like us part of us. We ask for your help. We ask for your special blessing on those with special need, on those living in fear, those living in pain, those with illness, those feeling disoriented and alone. Help us to reach out and to become neighbors. We offer our prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. continue to worship as we share our morning gifts.
Amen. The Lord bless us and keep us and make his face to shine upon us to be gracious unto us and grant us peace. Now and forevermore, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.